Welcome to another episode of Beyond Risk and Back. I am your host, Aaron Hugh. I'm very excited about today's episode because I just came up with the idea of this episode like 10 minutes ago. This is normally the time that I teach my family crisis consulting course. My colleagues who are on this course, we all work together and I teach them about my experience in working with families in deep crisis. I love this because I really get to share my time with parents and professionals who work very closely, not only with their own kids, but are really looking to get out there with their clients, increase their their ability to help families who are in deep crisis. And we share a lot of info. And I think that today's class needs to be a show because it's an important concept. We are having Colleen, who is a parent and is supporting other parents and families who are going through what she's going through. And she's talking about adoption. She's talking about when it gets bad, when they, when the kids turn into teens and the struggle gets deep. And on top of the normal teen struggle, we go beyond risk with the struggles. And underneath it, we have a massive wound, adoption. Adoption is a tough one. And Colleen is going to talk to us about her story. And I have with me two of my colleagues, people who are also students of this course. I have Yolanda, who I've known for many, many years. And Yolanda works with people who are going through abusive situations and children who are going through neglectful situations. And through this course, I met Leticia, who is friends with Yolanda. They have worked together. They have studied together. And Leticia specializes in families and supporting families who are dealing and working with LGBTQIA children. So we are going to learn from Colleen and we're going to interview Colleen. And this is how we do it here on Beyond Risk and Back. And I'm very excited because uh, I've, to be honest, wanted to do this for a while. The opportunity showed up today. And so here we are, uh, Leticia and Yolanda, welcome as a uh, co-hosts on my <laughs> show. I'm very excited. And Colleen, thank, thank you. you for agreeing to do this. This is awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. We've been having this conversation for a long time, so I'm glad that we can make it happen. As and this, as it is. Yeah, and this is the part where your story becomes medicine, right? This is the part where the stuff you've been going through is going to help heal. You shared with me today an email from one of your children who has adopted. And we had a little bit of back and forth on it. And I won't go into the details of the email, but it really did send home to me the level to which you have been dealing with the frustration, anger towards you and your parenting partner, what your kids have been going through, dealing with their wound and struggling with the, I mean, still struggling with the fact that they're struggling. And I know we'll get to that struggle in a little bit. First, Colleen, I would love for you to talk about your story, how you got to where you are, and to bring up some of the key points that you were going to teach us in our class tonight about adoption and being a parent who has adopted a child who is now struggling. Well, I am happy to. And, you know, it's interesting because as I was thinking about how I wanted to um, kind of lay out our story, I, and I don't know, I kind of took that step back and said, okay, what, how do people define adoption? You know, there's a lot of ways to define it. And, you know, the dictionary says it's the act or fact of legally taking another's child and bringing them up as your own or the fact of being adopted. And I kind of thought about that and I said, wow, what it really should be is the act of accepting responsibility for another person's child and raising them as your own as the result of profound loss and trauma. Because without loss and trauma, there's no adoption. The two kind of go hand in hand. And it took a while for that to really be pronounced in our family, but since it has, it's been, you know, quite the ride. And it, and it certainly didn't start off that way. Although in a sense, it started off with our loss, um, you know, being unable to have children ourselves. So, you know, we had to kind of grieve our loss before really moving 
into the consideration of adoption. And when we started thinking about it, I went to the Yellow Pages that long ago and, you know, under adoption agencies was Boulder County. And uh, and I thought that's interesting. I went to an information session and that's where I kind of learned about the foster care and foster to adopt and respite care and, and adoption. You know, I was really kind of taken by all the different steps and kind of the umbrella of it all. And then asked my husband to attend um, an information session separately. And so began like our two decade long relationship with Boulder County. Um, yes, we wanted to start a family, but, you know, in a sense, we wanted to also potentially affect change in a child or in a family only to come realize, you know, but their brains are really hardwired to not let us do that sometimes. Is that something you discovered or is that something that somebody told you? When, when I, I love what you just said, because we're, we're talking about an issue that's begun before you've ever begun the stewardship of these children, right? Steward is where you become responsible for something that doesn't belong to you. So were you informed of this? Were you trained that this was a potential? Not really. The neurological piece of it, not as much. What we did know and, you know, what the county did a great job of was, you know, yes, acknowledge your own loss and why you're here. And they make it perfectly clear that their number one goal is reunification. You know, that's the number one goal of the county, and we're here to facilitate that. And sometimes that happens, and in instances where it doesn't, you know, then there are families who are there to accept that responsibility forever. You know, they also make it perfectly clear that you assume that emotional risk, and you take on, you know, all those emotional pieces so that the kids don't have to, because quite clearly adults are better prepared to be able to absorb that risk, to absorb, to love kids um, as if they're your own in the time that they spend in your homes and then be willing to watch them get in a caseworker's car after two months, two years and go back home. And the kids are just so excited, you know, because that's where they want to be. While you're assuming that risk, that doesn't mean that your heart, a little piece of your heart doesn't get in the car with them. <laughs> you know, and you don't shed a tear or two. But um, when we started, we we kind of went in with the mindset that we wanted to get into the foster to adopt that transition. And we, and we were certified initially for kiddos from birth to two years old. And when our first placement was nine, <laughs> we said, oh, but we're not certified for nine. And they said, well, welcome to Boulder County. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> but oh my gosh. it was it was great because then it really kind of opened our eyes to the possibilities. And, you know, during our partnership with um, Boulder County, which it included a dozen or so placements in respite care, and we did have infants and we did have kids in middle school and, every, and you know, kiddos in between and everyone, each one of them taught us something a little different. There were more placements. There was respite care for other families and um, or very short term placements. And it, and then one day we got the, you know, and then we got the call that would eventually change our lives. And, you know, I remember it so clearly where I was and what I was doing. And here were four kids unsuccessful in trying to find one home for all four. So they were split into three homes. Our daughter, who was third in line, came with us. The two older siblings went to a family in Niwot and um, the youngest, our now son, went to a family in Lafayette. And, you know, when you get those calls, you just try to get as much information as you can, although caseworkers often have their hands tied as to what they can share. And even more so, I think, these days. I think that the county had kind of known about this family for a while and were kind of keeping an eye on them and had kind of offered them support and services over time. And mom just brought all four kids to daycare with more than they normally would have and knowing that she wasn't going to be able to pick them up, that she just couldn't do it any longer. With most kids, when they come into foster placement, through our experiences, there's kind of this honeymoon phase where they're new, they're they're kind of on their best behavior for a little while, and it's once they get comfortable and once they know they're they're safe is when 
some of the acting out kind of comes out and some of that trauma that they've just kind of been building up um, starts to, you know, to rear. But I kind of felt like one of our kiddos was traumatized from the beginning. She was, she was hard. She and her mom were super tight and, you know, she just, she was just shy of three years old and just cried and cried, you know, for her mom and for her siblings, you know, calling them all by name. And, you know, as you go through, the, you know, we were going through the process and through all the steps and um, birth dad had gotten custody of the older two kids after a couple of months. And he respectfully knew that he couldn't parent all four kids alone. And he had more of a relationship and was in the house longer with the older two than the younger two. And, and, and so it went. And, and that was really that event right there would, as I kind of go through this, will play itself plays itself out over and over and over again. You know, the kids have been abandoned once at daycare. And in a sense, they've kind of been abandoned a second time when, you know, dad made the hard decision not to take the younger two kids. Do you have compassion for the experience of those parents? Resentment, a strange human mixture of both sitting as long as you've been doing this, how many of these different scenarios you've been through, what's your view on this? Could it have gone better? Should it have gone better? Should the parents have, I don't know, fill in the blank? Or do you just have compassion? I have a lot of empathy. What we used to tell our kids, and we were pretty transparent and age appropriate, is that they they couldn't do they just couldn't do it and they if they couldn't do it well they they didn't want not that they didn't want to do it but i just think they knew their limits and i said look at us i mean we're two parents two working parents and, and we struggle so you know at times and so to look at um parents with whatever obstacles they have facing them at the time where I have all the empathy in the world for their mom who made that decision to pack bags for those kids that morning so that they would have their favorite stuffed animal, they would have some extra clothes for wherever they landed that night. And then we went to a workshop that was done in Boulder at a local church. And what they did was they put you in a scenario, not necessarily of a, of a parent, but as a person with limited resources in Boulder, and they ran you through, here's your salary. And they kind of ran you through a day in the life of a person who is trying to get from appointment to appointment, but relies on the bus. And if that bus is late and you can't get to the bank to withdraw that money to pay your bill. And it, it really kind of opened our eyes to what a lot of families go through. You, you know, Boulder isn't, it is a lot more, Boulder County is a lot more diverse than I think people know. And it, it serves a pretty diverse population. And there's a lot of people trying to keep it together the best they can, and whether it's for themselves um, or for their families. So no, we have a lot of empathy and, and we know the birth parents really well. And um, I can kind of get into, you know, birth mom lives two blocks from us. And we see her wow. occasionally. And, you know, and when, when I see her and I'm by myself and she's with friends, she's the first one to say, this is Colleen. She's raising, you know, these are my kid's mom. She introduces me as their mom. And she, you know, is always so thankful and asks about them and where, you know, I know where she lives and I'll, you know, slide pictures under her door or, on, or put them on her door, or leave a note with some kind of milestone. And so we try to keep that it we it never intended to be that open but it just organically kind of became that way what did you what did you and your husband do well that, that you can think back you can rely on it helps you sleep at night that you know from the beginning and even through the struggles that you're going through now what have you done well what we did well i felt was being as transparent as we could at age appropriate at times about why they're not with, you know, mom and dad. They knew their birth families. They knew their parents' parents. They now know their half-brother who lives in Louisville. You know, we've tried to do, they're Native American, so we've done some cultural 
things. We've kept them, you know, I think my biggest feather in my cap is we've kept them off of national TV and helped me find my family. Our daughter once told our son, you know, we're so lucky that we know who our brothers and sisters are. We know who our parents are because there's so many kids who don't. We did that well. And our son recently did a project based on the two books. One is um, The Beautiful Boy from the Parent's Perspective on Addiction, and one was from the son's perspective. And so he did a four or five page paper on it. And he kind of weaved our family story in there a little bit to say that my parents were a lot like, you know, Stephen Carell in the movie, that they're really resilient and they keep showing up. And so the fact that he sees that, I kind of take that as a win. As weird as it sounds, I think one of the other things we did was when, you know, there were times like a lot of teenagers who don't want to live at home anymore. <laughs> <laughs> their situation's a little different. So they, at different times during high school or during middle school, they didn't want to live with us anymore. And we're like, let's go see what your options are. And we went back to social services, back to the caseworkers we know, and on different occasions, and they sat with them and kind of painted a little bit of a grim picture. You know, maybe things aren't perfect at home, but there's no room in Boulder. Probably the, you know, the closest group home might be Pueblo that might have room. And they were like, oh, <laughs> we kind of honored their wishes to an extent. And so that's what I think we did okay on. How do you refer to the biological mother, the biological mother? I, yeah, I usually call the birth mom. Or we, so, you know, in our house, we just call her by her first name. You mentioned that you would run into her and she would introduce you to their people as the mom of her children. How do people react to that sort of closeness, given that a lot of people think of adoption as something to be kind of done, right? You adopt your child and then you're done and move on. I think that because she lives so close to us and, you know, Boulder can be a small place sometimes. And I think the first time I, I, it was kind of, I think it caught me off guard. But then I appreciated that she kind of saw me in that light and that I was kind of carrying her torch for her, if you will. E you know, and I think she talks about all of her children. And so they're like, oh, yeah, you know, you've talked about so-and-so and so-and-so. Um, she's had several children. So some of them are, you know, in Boulder County. A lot, um, most of them are not. They're grown and out of state, but I just think it was an or it became an organic relationship, even though we, that's not how we intended. That's not by any stretch how we saw this going. It just kind of happened organically. Uh, um, happened organically, but it caught you off guard. But still, that open mind that probably was the the compost for the that. Yeah. And, and you know, growth, truth right? be told, I would I would come looking for her sometimes too if it had been a long time and wanted to try to have the kids see her and you know oftentimes we arrange those visits in Boulder County because there was a caseworker who knew her pretty well and um, knew how to get a hold of her so you know some of the you know it took some effort at times <laughs> then there were other yeah. times we just see her on the bus or skate you know or just walking down the street so it, it's yeah it's kind of a little untraditional maybe at brabapp.com parents I have posted a parenting masterclass. Before you fast forward through this commercial, give me a chance, because I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to keep it blunt. This is a Telly award-winning parenting masterclass. Highest quality filming that we could accomplish. The content is everything I have ever taught a parent in the past 20 years of working with parents in crisis. There are three components to the course, 56 classes in three components. The red, the beyond risk, the crisis children, yellow, the at-risk children, and green. When things are going well, how do we get them to go great or keep them going well? It's everything I've ever taught a parent in 20 years of working with families. But here's the deal, it's $99. I want every parent to be able to have access to this course. So please go to brabapp.com, B-R-A-B -B for Beyond Risk and Back. Brabapp.com, B-R-A-B-A-P-P.com. Check it out for yourself.
it was kind of one of those where, you know, our adoption actually went really smoothly. Um, it was 18 months from placement to adoption and mom's parental rights were terminated. Dad relinquished uh, their Native American. So the tribe was, you know, had to be apprised at every turn. Um, so that was a little unusual, but we didn't go through the roller coaster that a lot of families go through. And our kids just transitioned so well, you know, during the process of fostering, you, you know, you have your, you have your visits with parents and siblings and they try to keep those connections. And our kids, you know, for a lot of kiddos, those are really triggering events. And for ours, I, I was always surprised. We'd get out of a visit and they would say, okay, what's for dinner? Or, you know, can we go play or can we do? So things were, you know, went well for a while. They really did. And, you know, and kind of thinking back a little bit, we had an adoption party. They were two and four. We had their last names put on football jerseys and it was in December. So kids decorated gingerbread houses. And then on that date, moving forward every year, that's, you know, we kind of celebrate by doing gingerbread houses every year. But knowing now what we know, as you know, we've learned more about loss and trauma, I probably wouldn't do that. You know, I'd probably, I wouldn't have celebrated the loss, but maybe done it a little more peace, but honored it a little bit more peacefully. What do you mean by celebrating the loss? That's a powerful well, statement. You know, it's, it's interesting, right? As we started off to say, adoption doesn't happen unless there's loss, great loss and trauma. Everyone celebrates their gotcha days and and their adoption adoptiversaries and things like that. And, you know, and I think that there are probably a great number of families who also, you know, while they're celebrating becoming a family or growing their family, probably do pay a lot of respect to the birth parents and talk about where kids came from. Because, you know, we always laugh and say, our kids are the only ones from Boulder. You know, we'll get asked, where where were you, you know, what country did you adopt your kids from? And I'm like, they're the only Boulder natives in the house. <laughs> you know? And everyone has a story. And I, I think maybe I would have honored it a little bit differently. I think there's a way to celebrate, but maybe would have done it a little bit differently now that I think about it. Was there a moment or was it a slow burn where you saw the trauma not just rooted? I mean, I, I, I think I think what I hear you saying is that we come into this work knowing that something traumatic has happened. We're seeing kids who are saying, uh, um, that was great, what's for dinner? And knowing what we know now, most likely that type A good child behavior was a way of it was compensatory, right? They were they were stuffing something down they didn't want to talk about or feel anymore. And the question now is, was there a moment that you said, oh, this is going this way, not that way? You know, did you know that something was coming down that wasn't going to be that fun? Not at all. Everything just went, I don't want to say it was easy, but it was smooth. Kids transitioned well. Maybe it was, you know, what had happened is dad had gotten custody of the older two kids. And after several months, the county had come to us and said, they're either going to go home together or be adopted together. Would you want, would you be open to having both kids? And to which we said yes. And although, you know, we had done a number of things together. So that was another transition. But again, it went fairly smoothly. <laughs> and I think our daughter was happy to have a sibling, you know. A sibling in the house and they were still you know they were young at that point we they were in foster care at one and three and we adopted them at two and four so not infants but still fairly aware of their surroundings to an extent and you know i would say things were going well kind of in just until they didn't you know i don't know that there was anything that really, if there was one incident that happened, I just think our daughter had always been pretty vocal and I think struggled from early on. And I don't know that our son really did. Maybe we're seeing pieces of it now and maybe trying to put some pieces of the puzzle together, but there wasn't one instance. I just think it was over time. And then we get into what your show is all about. Then we kind of get to that space that's 
so familiar for so many families where things go okay until they don't. And then maybe it's in middle school when you're trying to really figure out who you are and how you fit in. And that's when kind of the adoption, the abandonment and the attachment really started to, to go full throttle, you know, with arguments, with fights, with tantrums, tearing up her room, tearing up the house through back, back checks, um, through, you know, at some point when she started using substances during those withdrawal, it, almost every escalation ended in, why didn't they take us? Why didn't they want us? You know, the argument, the fight, the tearing apart the room was always about something else. And then I would say more than half the time, it always ended in, why didn't they take us? What was the answer? The answer was typically the, you know, what we'd been sharing them, sharing with them from the beginning was they could, they couldn't do it. They knew they could, they made that really hard decision that they couldn't maybe raise you the way they wanted you to be raised, or they couldn't do it financially. They didn't have, maybe they didn't have a home for you to stay. You know, when they came into placement, they were in a hotel up the canyon. You know, there's a lot of reasons. We never came out and asked what that decision was. You know, there are a lot of things that become important to people that become more important than other things. You know, whether it's your friends over your family, whether it's substances over your family, whether it's work over going to school, you know, things just take precedent. And not that there isn't room for you anymore, but they just knew they couldn't do it. They respectfully knew they couldn't do it. Dad certainly knew that he couldn't parent all four on his own. Um, he was on his own at the time. So, Colleen, at this point, the question becomes, what do you, because you've had a significant experience, what do you say to a parent, a, a potential mother, a potential father who is looking to become the steward of another child? Because I don't want this show to be, I'm talking out, talking them out of it. Like, because right. we, all, we all know the world needs parents to take on children who don't have parents. And so what do you say? What's your input and advice on that question? I think we'd all be lying if we didn't go into it at one point, wanting to save the world on some level, right? That we right. can love the pain out of kids that nurture is going to overcome nature. You know, I think we all go in because that's, we do it because it's the right thing to do. Not because we hope that one day they'll see that, you know, because I don't know that <laughs> sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But I, I just think there's some reality to it. You know why? That's why there's support groups. That's why there's platforms for people to crowdsource. And has anyone gone through this? What are your experiences? Can we talk? People are so much more open to learning from others right now. Certainly there are a lot more platforms for families to meet other families who have gone through the journey. And, you know, not everyone's journey is as complicated as ours. There have been a lot of bright spots in our journey. You know, there's been a lot of struggles. And I just think that's reality. Your own kids do this. Your your biological kids you're going to have struggles with and you're going to have, you're going to butt heads. You know, when we were talking about it the other day, we always felt like we have all that. Plus we're in the middle. We're in the middle of our kids and and their birth parents. You know, we just kind of feel like we're pinballed sometimes. I mentioned earlier in the show that I had read a letter that one of your children had written. And it was dig after dig after dig. Can you, at this point, not take it personally? Or do you still wonder why or how that the kids can't see what you've done for them? Or do they see it and they're just not talking to you? They're talking to the bio parent or... Because the letter was, it was hard. It was hard to read. And I've read letters like that before. But do you still take it personally? No. And we know that it's venting. We know we've worked with enough counselors and family therapists, and we've been through some parent coaching to know that, sure, we weren't, we haven't done it perfect. I don't think anyone does it perfect. And you try to do the best you can with what you have. We know that behind it, there's a lot of shame, which is, makes us really sad. And, and we think that that's really kind of the foundation for a lot of it. I think our daughter, especially 
is pretty vocal about how she wants to rewrite her story. And I, I just don't think it's gone as planned. Um, I think she really wanted a different story for the the one that she was born into. And there are times she's worked really hard to get out of it. And I think just has a hard time digging out from it. And then, you know, when met with obstacles or temptations and substance use and other distractions, um, it doesn't make it any easier. I have a little question. I've worked a lot in racial justice and I am wondering, I have friends who have children that are adopted from a different race. And I like to know your perspective on raising children that are in a different race and culture than yours. And I know you mentioned that you try to keep them connected to their to their culture, but I'm curious to hear your your perspective. The Native American community over time has worked really hard to try to keep kids with other Native families. And that's one reason why the tribe needed to be involved from the beginning, um, because at any point they could step in and could have gotten custody of the kids. But it's a pretty poor tribe. We didn't see that happening. And there was a bit of a plan B that if the tribe did, did step in, then birth dad was going to take custody and we just would have done a private adoption um, instead of through the county. But I think, you know, we, it, it's interesting because you, you sometimes forget you're raising Native Americans in a white home um, just because you're kind of just living your, your life. And it was the first time we took them to the pow, a powwow, our daughter came back and said, wow, this is the first place I've ever been where everybody looks like me. And it was pretty profound. I mean, and it wasn't as if we took them off the reservation. I mean, they were born in Boulder. So that was kind of a profound statement, you know, and we just kind of kept trying to find those opportunities. And sometimes they were open to them and a lot of times they weren't. We would try to go and do things that, you know, a couple of years ago, we actually drove out to South Dakota. Um, we have relationship with grandparents from both birth parents and um, birth moms, adopted parents live in South Dakota. And so we went to their reservation, which was really eye-opening as well. And we knew it was a pretty poor reservation and it it definitely came across that way. And, you know, we learned a lot and we got, we went to get their tribal cards was the reason that we had gone and uh, then to meet the grandparents from the other side. And so I, I think you just do what you can, you know, there's a lot of heritage camps out there. I don't even know if there's a heritage camp for Native American kids, but uh, there used to be one. I don't know if it's still yeah. going on. But you know, they're, be... they're 50% Native American, they're African American, and they're Caucasian. And so I always used to, I always used to laugh when the four kids would get together because I was like, wow, one, you know, one kiddo has really strong Afro features. One is, just, you know, spitting image of her mom, who's, you know, complete Native. And then the other two boys have, you know, kind of light blonde curly hair. <laughs> It's like, how are y'all really? <laughs> so yeah, I, I think especially as, you know, the kids got older and there are opportunities that you start to learn about for Native kids, whether it's in the school district or whether it's around, you know, you can, you all you can do is introduce it. Sometimes they wanted to do it. A lot of times they didn't. Your top three bits of advice for parents of adoptive kids who are struggling, what are they? I don't know if there's a three. I think there's a few things. Um, Avani Dilger, who we all know really well in Boulder, talks about a German, I don't know if he's a therapist, but Berg Hillingham, he would say that adoption is the most significant trauma. Attachment is the manifestation of that trauma, right? And then you have kids we used to stay very clear of class projects that involved family projects or family trees, you know, because for our kids, it's an intergenerational trauma. You know, they're both Native American. Both of their parents are adopted. So we used to say we don't have a family tree. We have a juniper bush. Um, Avani says, you know, you can't get out from this intergenerational trauma or it's pretty hard to do so. But then she says humans are built for trauma. Um, think back to the Stone Ages but we're just not meant to be stuck in it. And I think so many times the kids are just stuck in this. And it's so clear that our daughter is just stuck and just, 
has been trying to get out of this for years. And, you know, our son, we're not so sure about, you know, we can kind of think back to some things and maybe and say, oh, you know, maybe that was a manifestation of some of this where she's just, you know, so verbal and so physical. And, you know, he's, he's taken some chances, but we just don't, it's not really clear yet if this is, because he's never really been as verbal about it as she has. And I know, you know, there's that conversation around the primal wound and that separation of parents and, and mothers and children. And, you know, we know that in adoption, that the role model who's trying to fill the mother's place usually gets the brunt of a lot of the trauma to which I could definitely vouch for, you know, and when I talk about how it organically became a very open adoption and how mom lives really close to us. And we often wonder, you know, is this a good thing that they know she's okay and they know where she lives and they know she's safe? Or is it just this constant reminder of their loss? We kind of wonder about that. Is it good to not bump into them every once in a while? Or, and dad and the older two kids live in California. Uh, they were supposed to go out there for 10 months and they've been out there several years. And I know that they'd like to see them. We don't have a way to contact them, but I think that primal wound is there. I don't know that it can ever heal. Um, I think you are just given tools and strategies to work through it. And, and as far as strategies for parents, some of this is you grieve your loss or whatever brought you here. And we're grieving the loss, I think, some because I think you go into it with this picture of what your family is going to be like. And, you know, we did some hard work with a counselor who said, you know, I think you almost need to grieve the loss of the family unit you thought you would have. Not that it's not going the way you would plan, but it's definitely taken turns that we didn't expect. And there might be, you know, there's definitely one of the kids, you know, is definitely creating some distance and will they ever come back? Um, We'll see. We think so, but, and we hope so, but, you know, there's always those age appropriate conversations. There's always as you would do um, with any child, boundaries and consequences. And we have, in different support groups, we have conversations about consequences. I mean, what consequences do you put on kids who have already lost this magnitude of loss? What could you possibly consequence that's going to be greater than this? And so sometimes coming up with those consequences can get a little tricky. Just know that, be aware of the trauma and that they may likely not grow up and get out of it and be okay. Like it, you have to be ready for the long haul. Parts of it'll be smooth, some of it won't. And for us, a failed adoption was never an option. We have been through the struggles. We're still waiting for the nurture to (laughs) overtake nature. Um, And it's interesting because we kind of asked ourselves the other day when we were talking about this like would we do it again knowing what we know now would we do it again and we actually both said yes we would